So I've done that. And Bill, I was saying before you jumped on that this was a, a short notice call. Emmanuel and I were talking earlier in the week and uh, <clears throat> I was conscious that Monday, tomorrow is World Water Day. And then yesterday was spring equinox. And it was like, well, we should do something for World Water Day. Uh, in part because water is such a key piece and has been such a key piece around the Margarini piece and center. And uh, I also was sharing that as I have become more intimate with water as a ally, friend, resource, and, and so on, it, it does change my life. It has just really shifted it in many ways. And at the end of the call, I'd like to share a practice that's primary for me in, in working with that. Um, so I would like to also see where to jump in here. Um, I'm gonna sh I'd like to share my screen, but um, figure out how to do that. And uh, there you go. Let me share the sound. And I'll stop. Okay, here we go. Boy, I need to simplify my screen. Um, <laughs> what I want to show is this little video. And, um, I'm not sure what's really shown up on your screens. So we'll have to get rid of all of this. So just as a little meditation into water here, this is about a 37, 36 minute little video. Just invite us each to come into the presence of water. And, and just let yourself feel and be with this water from this little mountain. Creek. Let me um, let me get sort of responses to come up from the top. I'll jump in, Larry. The first image that came to mind was I was a uh, I was right at the there's a little motel. Uh, at the uh, sort of the uh, eastern end of when you come in to, <clears throat> to Yosemite. Yeah. And uh, right outside of that was that, that stream. <laughs> Obviously yeah. not that stream, but it was like that stream. And, uh, you know, that's probably one of the best rest I ever had was helping the, having, the, having the window open and listening to that stream. Uh -huh. it, was just an, it was just absolutely incredible. I still, uh, that's, that's the image that immediately came up. Was it. Beautiful, thanks, Bill. Anyone else, memories? I, I flashed back to the waterfalls on Maui. Uh, uh -huh and how beautiful those are and uh, how much people seek them out. <laughs> mm -hmm. how, how drawn people are to water, yeah. Yes. My mom lives in Western Massachusetts um, on like 40 acres of bubbling brooks and Word. mountains. And in the town that's nearby Shelburne, there's called the potholes. And it was literally, you know, the, the rock structures and stuff that was chiseled away by water and mm. now there's these potholes and in the winter they're just full and bubbling and it's so magical to sit next to the potholes <laughs> even when they're barely bubbling it's just 
to be on these rocks that were formed way back when and have water running next to you um, was always a treat to go to with my dad and just sit. Sweet. Even though I'm an ocean girl and I was brought up in Western Massachusetts and I don't know what happened there. Should have been, this mermaid ran away a long time ago, but those memories near the potholes and stuff are just great. Mm, that's great, Tisha, thank you. Yeah. I, I grew up in Oregon and two of the places that we lived on in my youth had a creek running through the property. And also, um, we're, I've always lived near the Columbia River, <laughs> either on the Oregon side or the Washington side. So um, water is integral. And in other years, when we actually get a lot of water from the sky, there's rain and there's just something about rain. A lot of people go, oh, I don't like the rain. And I'm going, how could you not like the rain? <laughs> it's, it's just so there's nothing like the sound of rain on the roof or or um, the scent that there is just before or just after the rain and I think it's called terp terpicor or per it's, it's there's an interesting name for that but yeah. when I saw that stream in the video I wanted to be in the stream wading and splashing and it might be 67 on the outside, but on the inside, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Marjorie. Yeah, for me, when you mentioned rain, I think of the smells of water. So that, that smell when it's going to rain or it is raining outside and just that's what came up for me, that smell. Recently here in Santa Fe, when it was actually starting to snow, I smelled the rain smell. And it was interesting to me that it would transfer for me because I'm from Miami and I'm, I'm used to torrential downpours and that smell was something I always associate with water. So it was neat to kind of smell it out here. <laughs> it was different than what I expected. So it brought me back to that smell somehow. Mm. Wonderful, April. Barbara, I want to welcome you in. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Hi. Hi, so sweet to see you here. This how, how did that happen? <laughs> um, <laughs> did you not intend this? Uh, I haven't. Oh, I haven't thought a lot. I, I, I thought you, you were in a session on water. Is that yes. true? Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, OK. So um, yes, and then I then I got confused with the time, and uh, so now I'm here. That's I don't it. want to disturb. Please go on. <laughs> Hello. We'll, we'll continue, and and but it's just I uh, want to acknowledge and, and welcome your presence. It's great to see you. Barbara's calling in from Germany, Justin. So um, that's great. And Emmanuel has not shown up, um, so he may not make it, but. We'll see. Yes, probably something with electricity or, or network or something, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, yes. Sabina, okay. Sabina says she, she's here in spirit. Oh, sweet. Um, so we're just really, Barbara, taking a little time and invoking the spirit of water and the presence of water and, and touching that. And... Um, I'll continue with something else, but Benny, anything? Oh, you did speak about being in Maui and the waterfalls and so on. Okay. Yeah. So and and Larry, I just have to say, I will also drop out again when when the kids come in. So okay. it's the uh, I'm I'm a bit watery today. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about flow, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking, that's a great example, Barbara. And thank you. It's like, what can we learn from water, really? You know, I mean, is a, is a real question. How can water inform our lives and our living? And flow is one of the ways and one of the things that it can, can absolutely teach us. And uh, I'm going to go back to screen share for a moment. And we'll show this video. And then uh, I'm going to try to pull together a couple other things. So... Um, Let's go. 
back to so as you let yourself feel this take notice that the water is cutting the rock and um, which we all know but we take for granted but it's like that the old piece right that the softest thing cuts the hardest thing also take notice that this is limestone that it's cutting so the limestone was laid down by old in an old seabed right by um, sea creatures and so it's water is i mean this is just this amazing geology and history of the planet um Tishy, you may have information about this that I don't, and, but the last I was really diving into water was about 10 years ago when I was doing a number of presentations on it. And at the time, there was some confusion among the cosmologists and, and so on about how old is water that's on the planet, with some people saying it's come in primarily since the Earth was created on asteroids and, and so on. And others were saying, uh, and it seemed to me that the dominant thinking was that most of the water that's here was is here because it was formed when the earth was formed. So that is what, like 4.5 billion years ago? So when you have a sip of water, you are literally in some ways touching and tasting the formation of the earth. It's available to us as that experience. And if we go back and just sort of, Bill, you mentioned the sound of the water and Vinny, I think you may have also, others have talked about the sound of the rain. You know, what's happening here is vibrations. And this is Bill, you're part of your territory of expertise. You're being touched and embraced by and swimming in and it's inside of our bodily systems, the vibrations of water that we're next to. In the world. And I really want to do this piece this morning. Let me, let's see, change the sharing here. I don't want to go to another Please. Here we go. I want to share this photo. Um, did I see the raindrop on the pine needles here? So mm -hmm. it's the, the poet Kabir who says, uh, everybody understands a single drop merging, merging into the ocean. But only one in a million understand the ocean merging into a raindrop. So a story to go with this quote is, um, you know, I was hoping he'd be on the call, but Tom, Tom Roger, we were talking the other day and he was talking about the first time I had him out on a river trip, on a wild water river trip. And he got up to pee at night and it was a desert trip, the San Juan River. And he remembered that I'd said, you know, don't pee on the land because it'll leave the residue and the bacteria will come in and, and grow on it and so on and it leaves the spot. So you've got to pee in the river. It's the ecological way to do that. And so he says, you know, I had my daily routine and from evening routine, had to get out of bed and go pee and go down to the river and remember what you said. And he said, I happened to look up at the, at the sky while I'm standing there peeing. And so he's looking up and he said, I almost fell over because there was such a river of stars above my head. And if you let yourself go back to some memory of that dark night and the Milky Way and the speckling of diamonds in the sky, it's like we cannot, if we allow ourselves to truly see water, if you will, we cannot see water without also seeing the stars. Because that's where the water is coming from, right? It's coming out of this larger space. It doesn't exist as an object apart from the relationships that created it and of which it is. And neither do we. And I suggest that all of our modern problems are coming from precisely this issue and this question. We've turned the world into an object. And that's the religious cosmology of our times. And in doing that, we turned ourselves into objects. 
and it created a wound of spiritual separation. And so learning to see the wholeness in ourselves, as Kabir suggests, and in the world around us, is learning to see the weavings and interweavings of these interbeings, to use Thich Nhat Hanh's language. And the scene of the water in this raindrop here, it's like we come into the world some 90% water. Some people say aging is dehydration. Right? So we are swimming. I really want to honor the feminine here and the feminine presence and, and you mothers that are on the call or whoever might listen to this. Because we each in our mother's womb swam in an ocean of ambiotic food. Water. It's water that's running through the veins of our blood, through the sap in the trees. It gives the fluidity to this. And Tisha, maybe you'll talk maybe a little later about the neurobiology, if you will, of water. But it's water that is the information carrier, not only within our system and allows the neurons to transport information and so on. The same is true in the mycelial network or in the network, the cellular network of the tree or any other animal. It's water that becomes and enables this flow of information. So water is this carrier of not only nutrition in that sense, but it's a carrier literally of information on the planet. So, and that's this next quote on the slide here, but <clears throat> from Thomas Berry, it's all a question of story. We're in trouble just now because we do not have a good story. We are in between stories. The old story, the account of how the world came to be and how we fit into it is no longer effective. Yet we have not learned the new story. And I wanna suggest that the new story is actually this old story. And it's this old story of innate belonging. It's this old story of innate worthiness. And so as we restory this, and as we come into intimate relationships with any of the elements, we come more deeply into, into intimate relationships with our own soul and spirit with each other. So I'm gonna try and share another piece here. Um, let's see. Well, Oh, I know, it's a, um, yeah, here we go. So <clears throat> I'm not as prepared for this piece today as I'd love to have been. This is a photo of uh, people from Margarini <clears throat> getting water, traveling to get water before the well went in. And so they had to travel this, I don't know what it was, uh, 10 kilometers or something like that. And they would fill all these water jugs. And so when the solar well went in or the solar pump in the well went in, it changed not only the children's lives and those at the, at the center, but also this wide community of lives. Because as Bill, you were alluding to, there's a, a drought happening there now and, and other wells in some neighboring areas have gone dry. People are now traveling 10, 20 kilometers to get five gallons of water. And then if you see these photos from many places in third world countries, the women primarily are carrying these five gallon jugs on their heads with water. And it's often not the cleanest water. So this thing too about wild water versus domesticated water, you know? When water is flowing, as we saw it in the, in the slide in the mountain creek, it's picking up and interacting with the with the environment around it, the oxygen and minerals and so on. And it invites life, the water of life. It has that mythic association and image for a reason. Because again, we are, our bodies and the organs in our bodies are literally formed by hydrology and structure. And it's this vibration thing again, Bill, of, of your world. So that you're so deeply, you know, <laughs> I look forward someday to sitting and just listening to you talk about vibrations. And 
Um, but, but water structures the human system, the body, as it does with all the animals. It's hydrology that's at play on the planet. And it's this interaction of fire, if you will, from the stars and the sun to give us a spark of life. In, in some images, images, we might say the masculine spark, you know, into this feminine water of life that lives inside of each of us. So this blending of the masculine and feminine. So coming into conscious appreciation and gratitude, intimacy and relationship with these pieces within brings us home in a deep, soulful, spiritual, physical kind of way. And maybe that's my riff. That's the rewilding of water, right? Within is when we become to see ourselves as who we most deeply are. And we allow this belonging because when we learn to see this unity that we're woven of, we drop the domestication of the enculturation of separation. And when we have that kind of belonging that water gives us, it is a rewilding of spirit and soul because suddenly I know that you and I are related. It's like when Emmanuel and I first met and I drove this little two track drive to the motel, um, the grass going in between the tracks in, in Oregon. And there was this black man standing in, in the tracks with pine trees around him and so on. And, and our eyes locked on each other and he just got this most, the largest, beautiful smile on his face. And I knew that I was looking at a man who was grounded into the earth. And his story is he, he saw me, the reason he smiled so big was because he saw a tree driving the car. So we each contain all of these pieces, this depth. You know, our own beings are, you know, when we drink of water, which we'll do before the call is over together and have a sip, that becomes the practice that water becomes a portal into wholeness. A portal into remembering who we are at the deepest level and touching that nourishment and allowing it in as a vibration to inform, inform our living and our lives. So it's a time of great crisis on the planet. Lots going on. And I'd like to sort of open it up and, and throw this out for one responses, but also to see your life is structured. And as you move into, you know, you could speak to your work with Jay and his work or, you know, however you want to enter this, but just invite you to share. Um, and, and then we'll open it up for other people to share as well. So I'll change my screen again, stop sharing. Thank you. For so I was a, I remember being on my dad's shoulders as we walked to the first time I saw the ocean. And I knew at that moment that I was home to me, mm. even though I grew up in the mountains of Western Massachusetts. And by 17, heading down to Florida after graduating 18, I was a dolphin trainer. Mm. And with, by the time I was 22, I was an activist trying to get these keeping in a lot of captive work to understand the animals intimately. And it always came back to water. So I did eventually get my marine science degree because the animals in the water were my deepest connection. Um, in the meantime, I'm traipsing all over in tents in Baja or Hawaii studying monk seals on remote islands and never making money out of it. It was always about uh, being rich in my adventures. Um, and that's how uh, Wallace J. Nichols comes in is he was studying turtles in some of the same places I was. By the way, I've never met Jay in person. And we have walked parallel lives. And Jay 10 years ago wrote a book called Blue Mind. And it just made sense to me that 
everything from a spring to a babbling brook to the ocean to the you're taking a bath to a float floating um, experience. Water is is what makes our minds calmer. And so Jay's been doing the neuroscience of water and I've been continuing to be the scientist walking alongside of him, um, trying to help creatures. But Blue Mind makes sense to me in this water concept of us being made of water, us being pulled by the moon. All of it is a connection that we need to ground deeper into in order to save the water, which is what Blue Mind's about, a movement in order to appreciate how much we love water, we have to keep it sacred and save it. In the meantime, that will go on to save what I want to save is the creatures and the oceans themselves. And so it's become, for me, a labor of love to save the animals and save the water and save the environments. I sat on a remote island, and I'll put a link to one of my interviews that I talked about this, but I couldn't tell that monk seal that I was studying that year that it was not going to go extinct and it became an aha moment for me that I had to stop just writing out the forms for the governmental organizations that I work for National Marine Fisheries, NOAA, all good organizations but they stopped feeling the water or that animal and it, we became data points and to me you weren't going to save an animal by those data points so I went back for a master's. I ended up triple mastering. And I came out with Global Ocean Network as my idea of how we can help our planet by collaborating as a global entity. And so Global Ocean Network came to fruition in 2016 onto paper. Unfortunately, we had an administration that came in that wasn't going to be supportive of Global Ocean Network. So I've taken the last four years to grow my army, get to know really what we need on this planet to become stable as a platform. And instead of a nonprofit, Global Ocean Network is now gonna be a consulting platform of collaboration so that we can help the nonprofits get to solutions faster. And four areas came to mind where we're lacking. In science, policy negotiating, wherever you go in the world, um, and manpower and funding is where we always fall short in these nonprofits. So Global Ocean Network will contribute in those four areas so that these organizations can get to solutions faster and not always have to be competing for grants or working with government problems. So I was taught a long time ago by one of my mentors, Steve Leatherwood, who was a whale expert in San Diego that we have the government on one side and we have what we call the humaniacs on the other, which I love, Greenpeace, Sea Shepherd. You have to walk up the middle in order to be effective. And so Global Ocean Network will be that up the middle platform that works with us humaniacs and the governments. And we present ourselves in a way that we're not thinking from one country or one animal, because if you don't put humanity as the source of it, you're not gonna save those environments or those animals because there are people that are hungry, thirsty for water. There are people that don't know why poaching isn't feeding their family. It's actually causing a bigger problem in the world. So we have to find a way to make it valuable to humanity in order to save our planet and the water. And that's where I came to meet Jay uh, Nichols. And I think we have to approach it not just from a scientific mind, but from a spiritual or humanitarian connection. Mm. Thank you, Tishy. And by the way, I just got a <clears throat> text from Emmanuel. He's electricity just came on and he's uh, trying to log in. Like we see him coming in. Yeah. Come on. Cool. There he <laughs> is. Four platforms. Uh, Hi, Emmanuel. The four platforms you had policy making, manpower, funding. And there's Jay. Wow. Bill, we'll so, come back to that. Bill, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I'll give an uh, interview I did. I'll put a link and it discusses it more. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so Jay, I want to welcome you in. Your microphone's muted. You can go either way. And Emmanuel, welcome in. Uh, 
Wonderful. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for for delay. That's um, we were guessing it was electricity, and so. Uh, th thank you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, glad to have you both be able to get on. And um, so we were going to try and go for until about a uh, quarter after the hour. We'll just see where we go here, but I don't know where to catch up. Um, but Emmanuel, maybe you could speak firsthand to, and I did show a slide earlier of people gathering water at, before the well, you know, and when people had to travel to get water for the, the Margarini Children's Center and so on. And, you know, what is water in your world as a farmer and as a person that has, you know, 270 children that you care for? and people coming in now at great distance to get water. Just share what you would, Emmanuel, for a, few, a little bit here. And maybe your screen is frozen or maybe it's mine. It says, here you are. Hello. Emmanuel, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Larry, for, for that. And uh, to say about uh, water, and I want to be specifically here in my community and uh, other adjacent community at large. Uh, we have uh, like a two or three types of hunger or two types of hunger and uh, that has really uh, touched the minds and uh, the bodies of the people in my community. First, there is the hunger when people don't harvest and they don't have food, so they get into hunger. But people don't speak much about this hunger of missing food. But most of our time, when there is no rainfall and uh, the drought persists, then there is hunger of water. You cannot get enough water. You cannot get water to drink. It is this hunger that displaces the people. People move from one point to another to just get up to a point where there is water. I experienced myself, I think it is seven years ago, we many people had to move to a river and the river was almost dry, but people could dig at least to get water. And this was something that it's not a something to ask, it's not something questionable. It is something that everyone has to find and get this resource. So when the when drought came, then you realize that people do really come together just to share this precious resource, water. People could queue, very long queues, just to share this water. And it is this during this time when you see that uh, when someone has uh, at least 20 liters of water, he or she is willing to share even a cup to give to another person because they, uh, they feel they are connected with this issue. They are connected to this problem. They are connected to this hunger of thirsty, of not getting enough food. Having shared that, I came to realize on my own, uh, also like uh, six years ago, when we could not have um, uh, water at the center, we could travel 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers. If I say 30, meaning you go 15, you come 15 and you walk only to carry 20 liters of water to bring at the center or to buy to, uh, 20 liters of water to bring at the center. And it is this water that you'll see the children don't even want a drop to drop out 
or down. Everyone wants to have a sip. Everyone wants to have a sip. And th through this water, you see another one sips and they shared this. We could, I could just see and look and watch and see how precious is the water is. And also how scarce is it to be obtained? It's until when uh, we made the uh, we 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 made the survey and then water was uh, uh, found at a, 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 at the center and then it took like two years to find the money to do that to make to drill the borehole which went 200 meters deep to bring this water and when I think of this 200 meters deep to get water that help now not only the children at the center but it helps the community that used to walk 20 kilometers to fetch only 20 liters of water now they can walk just a few uh, uh, meters or one kilometer two kilometer and then come and get water at the center and if i see them queuing uh, to get this water it looks like uh, in the whole world those who have water within their uh, 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 reach, those who don't have water within their reach, but it looks like all of us, all of us, we are connected and to this water. It's like a string that uh, is uh, is just moved like a thread that is uniting us within within this. Because in every day you can feel another person by just a sip of the water, especially when you share this water and you feel this is very scarce resource as we have experienced at the center. And right now is very dry here, is very dry and it has been dry and the water from uh, the government uh, uh, resources have been also very dry, or come or don't come. And people have been moving to the center just to say, we need to have water at no matter what, we need to have this to save ourselves. And just sharing this water, you feel the life and the, that it brings within the hearts of the people. So, I'm here and uh, just thinking on uh, the same water or how I would love to to have it and to have it and in abundantly to share and to share and to grow food because it is something that we all need. So this is how much water is very important until now that uh, people really, even if they don't, they walk few kilometers, but balancing 20 liters on the head on head, and then walking and there, it should be very careful. They choose, they do really care, take care of the water, not to split, not to lose that water. So I have learned to take care and uh, of the water as a very scarce resource and uh, with this awareness, it has given me a deep sense of feeling one another in terms of if someone says, I'm thirsty, then I know what it means to be thirsty. I know what it means to lack water just to quench your thirsty, to walk a long way in the dry and the very hot, then uh, I know that uh, it is my obligation, it is my uh, uh, responsibility to protect, to take care, and to see that this resource is well, well, well protected and taken care of because it is scarce. But still it unites us all and gives the sense of life between our hearts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emmanuel. I um, would just ask you, I've heard you speak a few times about watching the children share water. And I wonder if you could just 
speak briefly to that among themselves? Yeah, that was that was before and now. Now they share water, but they they share water in abundance, like they eat, they drink to satisfy the thirsty. But before that, you know and you feel exactly that these children are sharing this water with awareness that everyone needs a drop of water. That was very touching. Because you see a cup, a cup like this one, for six or three people, or for six or four people, you just have, and then you give another one, and then another one, and then another one. And you see at this time, it is the time instead of solving conflict because of this resource, you see it was, this problem was bringing the children together and humbling themselves giving them a sense of feeling one another that they need to share this little or very small water so that they can all survive because they knew that uh, we had to travel long distances to find this water. It was very touching to see uh, this humbleness as children try to share this water. It is until now, but this time it gives joy because it is not only this cup of water, but it can be this cup of water full for yourself. You can drink into all, and then you can give another one to get another one like that, of which it was not the same during these droughts when we could not have the borehole at the center. Thank you, Emmanuel. It really brings it home the um, how easy it is to take for granted what we can turn on at the tap. Um, I would really like to um, also just welcome you in Jay, Dr. Nichols, and Tisha. You were speaking of him earlier, and, and you got introduced, uh, Jay, before you came on the call. If you would love to, I'd love. We were talking earlier, and I wasn't using this language, but the. The language that's coming to me at the moment is the gift of deep identity. So when we know ourselves as water, you know, it, when we know ourselves at that elemental level is, is part of who we are, we can treat it differently. And I um, understand in, in many ways, this is some of your work, Jay, and if, I'd love to just have you share what you would have. And, and yeah, it's an honor to have you here. Thanks for showing up. Mm. No, the honor is mine, and uh, thanks for Tish to Tishy for inviting me, and Larry for convening, and Emmanuel for sharing your your personal and community story. Really um, makes a lot of sense, and it it hearing you speak changes. You know, I can walk three steps from where I'm sitting and turn a knob, and water comes gushing out, and I certainly take that for granted. And I know my children do. And um, learning from you and your family, I hope helps uh, people who take their water for granted to, to think differently. Um, I just say, you know, the, the thing that keeps coming to mind and that I've shared and Tishy knows this over and over is that when, when we undervalue or overvalue anyone or anything, bad things happen. So when we think something is more important than it is, or someone is more important than they are, or when we think something is less important or someone is less important, we do bad things. We, we wreck the place. We, we treat each other poorly, we treat water poorly, we run out, we, we wreck the river, we pollute places, we cut down forests. But when we value things well, accurately and wholly and respectfully, when we get that value equation correct or closer to it, 
it shifts the way we perceive each other. It shifts the way we perceive the water, the river, the animals, um, the homes we live in. And so that's really, my work has been about fixing the value equation. And it isn't all, it is not a money equation. It's a value equation. It's the value, the value can be measured with dollars, of course, with money. It can also be measured with time. It can be measured with attention. Um, there are emotional values that are harder to quantify, of course, and spiritual value. But when we get that, we get that equation wrong, things start to fall apart. And when we get it right, we thrive as a community and as a species, really, in relationship with each other, with relationship to the other species and the water. So that's really what I what I would offer as just an idea. Um, to consider and in Emmanuel and your community, I, I, what I see is that the children and the adults have the value equation around water is very strong. To share it with humility and joy and generosity and reverence is part of that value equation that, and it's so strong there out of that experience of walking so far to bring so little water home, even when the water comes into the community, that value equation hopefully holds up and there remains reverence and protection and, and the sacredness around water. Um, that's hard to hold on to sometimes, you know, uh, but that's the challenge as now you have the borehole and your community and you've got less distance to travel. So um, anyway, thank you for, for sharing with us from so far. Uh, I'm in California, just uh, to like make the, the geographic connections. Um, We're about uh, I'm on the Monterey Bay. Oh, good. Yeah. You're down by the aquarium. Yeah. Um, good to you there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can, you know, I can relate a bit to very, very little, I have to say, uh, and this is this is a stretch, but listening to stories about water scarcity and what people, the work people do to bring water into their communities. Um, we, we had this past summer in California, uh, 4 million acres burned in the, they don't call it a wildfire anymore, they call it a mega fire. And we lost our home and every, everything I own. Uh, and when I went back out to the property a day after everything burned down with my daughter uh, to see what was left, and there was nothing but metal from the roof uh, and the fireplace. Two things, the well is there. The well is still there and the creek that goes by the house. And I took off my clothes and I got in the creek because the water was still flowing and um, just soaked in there for, the water took my grief uh, gladly. And I have, still have a lot of grief and the water still takes it. But that's another thing about have, ha having sufficient water in your community to use it not just for hydration and hygiene, you know, to quench the thirst and the hunger that you described so poignantly, but water also is our medicine for our, our hearts and our minds and our souls and our bodies, yes. of course, but first, yes. first our bodies, because if you, mm -hmm. if you can't walk and you can't think because you're dehydrated, yes. then none mm -hmm. of the other things work. But water is joy, water is play, water yeah. is, romance water is mm -hmm. it helps with with our grief when you splash your yeah. body joyfully not just as a function for hygiene but as um a spiritual practice and also as yeah. play for ch especially the children playing with water but you yes. can't play with water if you're worried about every single drop hitting the ground and being lost so 
I lo look forward to hearing the children's stories uh, when they learn to play with water. And because water is very playful and it's the best toy you could say to play with. Mm -hmm. um, if you have, if you're not in that place of scarcity, uh, it's also a great place to soak your body, not mm -hmm. just for hygiene, but for your mental health. It takes, mm -hmm. it pulls the stress out of us and it pulls the grief out of us, at least temporarily. And that's some of what we try to teach people during this pandemic. Uh, there's just way too much anxiety on earth. And if water can help us reduce that so that we can be more loving, more compassionate, more creative and more collaborative, yeah. that's a good thing. So um, uh, I know that building a big swimming pool is probably not a, the best use of water in your community, but maybe a little one. <laughs> I don't know if that's too, too much of a, uh, too wasteful, but um, getting in the water for children, especially, and just playing is, uh, is a nice thing. So it made me think, Emmanuel, do you, are there, when their rains come, do you have bodies of water that flow abundantly enough to, to get into, to, to, to bathe in? Is that? There are, there are some, uh, not always, but uh, if the rains are very heavy, children do not go out. But when the rains are, are genuine, you see children playing with the rainwater and uh, running up and down. Mains on the surface also bring the 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 some contamin the contaminated, and then um, mosquitoes and other uh, breed there. So it's uh it's hard to see that uh, there is a place of water where place children can uh, can do play, and uh, this as. Uh, as you are explaining, I deeply, oh, I was so deeply moved. And uh, especially when you said it's a healing. And uh, I relate to that and I feel that and it's very true because um, sometimes here I see children and other people drink a lot of water if it's available and then uh, you see other children saying, you don't, you have to drink water, it's free. You should not wait until uh, you get water in the hospital, which is very expensive. And uh, you see, it's it's just a part of people, of the children, our people, meaning that uh, as they drink the water, they get the healing into, the, into their bodies, into their heart. So when you are sharing that, it's a uh, it's so touching and it's really removing griefs i agree with you thank you so much for sharing that hmm. i'd like to you know there's been a lot of thoughts provoked by that and one is that uh i'm a retired licensed marriage and family therapist and have a sand tray and when you put water in that sand tray, the play therapy changes. Mm -hmm. And people become, tend to become more open and more willing to, it just becomes a more revealing session when you put water in the sand tray, whether you're doing it with adults or kids. That's a great insight. Really, yeah. I, I I, I can feel that, how that would, would work. Um, and just so, Emmanuel, um, there's a therapeutic tool that's used uh, called the sand tray. And uh, people sometimes don't get to play in sand very much and it's very, very appealing and relaxing to put your hands uh, yeah. or maybe your feet into the soil, into the earth, into the sand mm -hmm. and move, mm -hmm. move it and um, it opens people up. And then when you add water to the sand, like a beach or the, the shore yeah. of a river, um, it shifts our, shifts our minds a little bit. Yeah. 
Jay, one of the reasons I invited you today is because the first time I met Emmanuel, we were talking about soil mm. and putting our feet in the soil. And it was so blue mind to me to make that connection. And when Larry decided to throw this little get together today, I was like, oh my God, there's the total connect. So just listening to you both is music to my ears. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there's an interesting phenomenon of sand <clears throat> and soil. And uh, you can take a stick and create an image uh, with a stick, using the stick as a marking tool applied to the soil or the sand as a smooth surface. So it's a stick marking tool applied to a smooth surface, which if you think about it, a pencil applied to paper is the same thing. And in essence, what happens is the ability to produce words, symbols, and images are really a fundamental function of having a marking tool applied to a smooth surface. Uh, that allows you to have words, symbols, and images and create stories, uh, stories that we are now sharing. But it all comes back down to the fact that there's a fundamental thing that's going on and uh, just, uh, just on three levels. One is that you can take a stick and, uh, and apply it to smooth surface sand or soil. Uh, the other is that water flows and it flows, but fundamentally water, if you believe in science, is really a molecular structure uh, as is our DNA. Uh, so everything starts flowing in a certain way, as is what we talked about earlier on, electric current. So when you're dealing with electric current, you're dealing with the flow of electrons. So we deal with the flow of electrons at the most fundamental level, and we flow it in either direct current or alternating current. All this stuff is connected by flows at the most fundamental level. Yet when we are able to produce words, we talk about it in terms of stories and we sort of forget, we end up in entering the mind and sort of dismiss the body. Mm. And I think what Emmanuel has always been talking about is getting into the body, getting into the soul, getting into the spirit of the body, which, uh, Dr. Nichols, I think, is sort of a similar kind of a thing when you're talking about value. It's a similar kind of thing that I write about when I talk about beneath words, which is how do you get beneath words into what lies there. Um, I, I, Wendell Berry has been coming up a bunch in my life just in the last, well, probably week. Yeah. Uh, before then, I hardly ever thought about Wendell Berry or even knew what he was or anything else and so thank you Larry but I'm gonna read a little poem okay oh, and that is Wendell Berry's poem called Peace of Wild Things yes Have, are you familiar with that I love this poem thank you for when the, it of the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be I go and lie down where the wood drake I got to flip the page here. Where the wood rake rests in the beauty on the water, in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. And so when you go where the wild things are and you lay down with them, uh, there's a certain freedom there. It's, it's, it's about getting beneath words yeah. and into the body. Thank you, Bill. It's such Thank a you, Bill. Yeah. And um, this idea of 
of touching the wild and wild water and actually <clears throat> using water as a portal into the rewilding of the self is, is something that we talked about, um, Emmanuel and, and Dr. Nichols, Jay, before you came on. Because it really is this oneness that we weaves all of life together. And this practice that I was alluding to as the call started that has changed my life. Um, I call it one, one sip or one glass. And so if you have water available, I invite you to, you know, just to, to have that available here. Um, so we'll take a, a minute and everybody can grab something like that as we move towards closing the call. Um, I just oh. thought that this glass is for Emmanuel. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Wow. Oh, so, and that's it. Why? Just so, um, want to honor everyone for showing up here and the, the heart and the spirit that does connect us and the water that connects us. And so, I mean, this practice arises exactly out of that as I begin to realize in my own life and let water touch my spirit and soul and watch the grief away and the pain and the traumas of my life. That it is this, you know, it, it's hard, it's beyond language, Bill, to, it's underneath because the language only touches the surface here. And so what I began to discover was I could allow water or anything, anyone to touch me beyond words, beyond the mind and to let it simply into my system as a presence and a living energy. And the more I did that with water, the more it changed and transformed me and the more it allows me, still working with me to see the world in its wholeness and to see myself in my wholeness. And that I belong in the same way that the water belongs because I am woven of water. This is who I am. This is this gift of deep identity again, right? We come into the world, as I said earlier, 98, 90 some percent water. And that, you know, we dehydrate as we age, quote unquote. And some people say age is dehydration. So what is it to come to this glass of water with all these things, these beautiful qualities, Jay, that you were speaking of, you know, humility, joy, uh, reverence, healing, play, romance, you know, and hygiene. And to know that when I take a sip of this water, I'm touching literally the, the birth of the planet. Right? That it's that old and that this birthing of the planet is still occurring. And I partake of it when I take this sip of water. And I too, as you suggested, I think it's tissue that it, we can touch. I began to use this as a way to, to touch you, Emmanuel across the distance because this water, when I sip of it, we are partaking of the same glass, the same water. And I send prayers to you this way. And I send prayers to my Northern Cheyenne friends and, and around the globe. And I send prayers for the planet and people. And, but, and I can also let in whatever gifts I need for the day. You know, the healing of grief. And the gratitude that I meet this with, the consciousness, the mindfulness, all of these things can be held in a sip of water. And so with this, let's, this invitation, one, to take this sip mindfully and be touched by this living presence, being this sacred relationship that gives us life, the water of life. And so maybe we'll take several sips here and, and let everyone speak to what they would like to sip and give or receive, or whatever. But um, this is to this gift and gratitude that holds and binds us together as we awaken as a, as a species to who we are and where we are on this living planet with the living water it gives us the consciousness to be grateful and awake. 
to who we are. So I will drink to that. And I also want to, and I think Kishi, you said it, it's, I want to offer a sip here of gratitude to you, Emmanuel, to Margarini, to what's happening there at the center. There's a growing creative place of international transformation and change for human consciousness that is connected to the earth, to the planet out of which we arise and which we are not separate from. To this vision and future with solar power coming there and what that brings, both the gifts and the challenges. Um, but this voice of peace from the soil is also peace from the water, Emmanuel, that you carry. And um, you know, here's to that vision in that future. My brother. I just want to speak, this is Marjorie. I just want to speak to you, Emmanuel. I think it's serendipitous that your birthday is tomorrow on the World Water Day. That that seems very appropriate <laughs> that that would happen. That that the person that you are, not only the deep loving the soil and the soil will love you back but also the water and the whole piece of that and just the difference that you have made personally in my life meeting you and and basking in your wisdom and and the joy of what you give and what you do it has meant a great deal to me personally mm. aquaman <laughs> I, I didn't do it intentionally uh, but I, I told them your background yeah. there's a turtle here oh. and, uh, oh. inside of the turtle are eight other different sea creatures mm. oh. Mm. Oh. That's beautiful. I like that. Oh, yeah. Wow. And Jay, go Packers, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Someone's got his sweatshirt on. Tonight, 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 Jay is um at five thirty Pacific time. Jay reads from his book. We're in a book club. His book, The Blue Mind. If you all want to come in, and uh, we're on chapter eight, I believe. And Jay reads to us from his book that's been here for ten years talking about the neuroscience of water and the blue mind that you can have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we record them if, if the timing is poor for you. We, it's just, a, it's become a, an annual ritual that we've done for the past decade or so. And we just read together every night a little bit and talk about it. And the community, wow. If, um, wow. the book club community shares with each other. If wow. you can post your, uh, that too, Jay, that would be great because yeah, a lot fun. of people couldn't make it today. I mean, Bert said he was going to be here and he loves you, Emmanuel and Robbie and uh, Shoshana. They were all, they all couldn't make it, but they piped in. Yeah. So I'll post some stuff too and, and including your site, Jay, but if you want to type it in, that's great. Yeah, my book club. Um, um, it's very low key. You don't even need a book because I read the whole thing. That's the nice part about it. <laughs> <laughs> people get oh do i need a book no no book required that kind of book club um i'll take that tell in, them, but... can you tell them just how also you've made it a movement with the marble the blue marble oh yeah we we um find the blue marble to show you do you have one tishy andy i do <clears throat> uh we in the in the spirit of adding value to our, our 
perceived value of water. Um, and as a scientist, I, I was seeing the water story was always a sad story and always one of um, problems. And, it, and I felt like it needed more gratitude. So I, I'm aware of all the problems of water scarcity and water pollution and mm. plastic and all, I'm aware of all the problems. I'm not, I'm not shying away from that whatsoever. But if we just keep mm. being angry and sad, we will burn out. 100%. And yeah. I felt it myself. I know yeah. you've all felt it too. You see it in our friends and colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to inject some gra more gratitude and more joy. Wow. And we started giving out mm -hmm. these little glass blue marbles that are made out of recycled glass. And they they have essentially wow. no value, no monetary value. Mm -hmm. But we share them with gratitude as a symbol of the water and the good that people do. And the simple observation that our planet is mostly a blue planet because of the water and life mm. depends on the water. So we started sharing them at an event in Boston <laughs> and it went so well that people started wanting to get marbles at every event. And now we've shared a million marbles around the world. Wow. And basically it's a simple wow. thing. If if you get a marble, carry it until you want to say thank you to someone, and then you pass it on. Yeah. And the alchemy that happens is fascinating because it's a marble has a pen, it's worth a penny. It's very, it's recycled glass. It has nearly no value. But once you've carried it for a while, it becomes your favorite thing, like a totem. And then when you pass it on, it has more significance. And that alchemy is fascinating. So if we can alchemize a, a sphere of glass and people say, this is my, I'm not giving this away. I love it too much. Just the, the ability of the mind to alchemize through value, perceived value is an interesting lesson that I'm still learning. Mm. But if we can do it with a blue marble, we can do it with water and we can do it with each other and we can do it with the forest, and we can do it with the soil, um, and we can do it with you know, our perception of children and uh, our elders. And so it's a source of optimism, basically, is what I'm saying. Wow. And it's, mm. uh, so I'd love, I'd love to give, maybe Tishy can hand you a blue marble virtually, Emmanuel. <laughs> <laughs> you have to grab that through. A, unfortunately, yes, yes. you're too far yes. and we're too travel limited right now to hand each other actual marbles, but, but the day will come. I, I, I always thought that if Jay gave me a marble, I couldn't give it to anyone else because it's, <laughs> I have never met Jay in person. And, and now I feel like all of you get a marble from me because I've never met any of you in person yet. And we've been coming um, together for so long that I just had to mention the marble. I'm willing to give it up, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm willing. I'm willing to receive it with all my heart. That's great. I think we'll get the children marbles. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. That's an, that's an easy and fun thing to do. I think that's a mm. yes. <laughs> wow. Well, I want to raise my glass, and um, there's a salutation that I've been using for quite a while. Um, it's simply, I wish you water. Mm. And what I, what I mean by that is I wish you life. I wish you health. I wish you peace. I wish you joy. I wish you play. I wish you romance. Mm -hmm. I wish you healing. I wish you love. I wish you all of the, the great things that the water brings. So, but simply put, I wish you water. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank Jen. you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I'm just feeling what it is to let that into my body as I take that sip. Jay, thank you so much. Because it is so much a story about our bodies and how we inhabit them. Or not.
And, um, you know, we, it's, this is just such a beautiful gathering of people. It's hard to let it go. Um, we've been on for over an hour and a half and so grateful for everyone that has shown up that is here. And, um, you know, I, I maybe just go back to this Kabir quote, millions, millions can see the raindrop in the ocean, but only one in a million can see the ocean in a raindrop. But here's to that vision spreading, you know, because water carries it and is the carrier of that vision. And I love the work that everyone here is doing because it is a spreading and a sharing of that wholeness. Of that vision. And I look forward to more with each and all of you. It's an honor to be on the call together. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll post some resources in the, the, the poem and, and your work Jay and Tishy, your ocean network and so on too. And deep gratitude. And I just want to say, I think Larry is one in a million brother. <laughs> yeah. He thinks the same of you. Thank you. Cool. Love you all. Marjorie, good to see you and Bill. Yes. <laughs> we'll see you, Tishy. Yeah. We have another friends call in a couple of weeks, uh, friends of Margarini, when we'll focus more. Um, I think that's on the 11th of April. And um, thanks for posting that, Jay, your link. I see that's there. If people want to grab it and we'll share it. Um, <clears throat> but a friends call on the 11th and we'll spend more of our focus around what's happening at Margarini. There's so much exciting stuff going on. The roof's going on the, floor, the new classroom building, the US Embassy grant, solar power is going on. Uh, the chickens are laying eggs. They got 500 uh, chickens, Jay, and, and it's going to change the diet of the children. Um, expecting the rains to come, hopefully, and planting will be occurring. And uh, there's uh, so much happening there. Thank you all. Travel well. Thank you, Larry. You know water. Thank you. Have a Thank new you so much. Day. Thank you. Yeah. Loved all of you. Bye. Mm, thank you. Same to you. Love much to you. Uh, yes. Okay. Goodbye, one and all. Go Packers. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Go water. Go life. <laughs>